everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. started we have less than an hour to solve the problem of supporting women entrepreneurs through public policy so not a big lift here but we should get go ahead get going my name is Kristen Mattern and I work for Dell on America's government affairs and we're so happy to have you here we want to hear from you, the audience members, so be prepared to give us your solutions, your calls to action. Tell us what's worked for you. You are on the ground, in the field, being the entrepreneurs, um, being the public policy experts, so we're here to connect both of you and try to find the best solutions going forward. So with further ado, I'll kick it down, down the panel to my boss, Chris Turner. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, all the applause goes to Kristen. She's the one that uh, makes all of this work. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, my name is Chris Turner. I am uh, Vice President uh, for Government Affairs at Dell. I handle the Americas. Uh, maybe we can just go down the line and introduce ourselves and then uh, just roll into it. So, oh, hello. Good morning, everyone. So um, my, my particular dimension of diversity is I'm more an afternoon person rather than a morning person. So just kind of roll with me here. So my name is Angela Roseboro. I am the head of global diversity, equity, and inclusion for Dropbox. I'm Hillary Rosen, a public affairs exec in uh, Washington, D.C., and a CNN political contributor. Andrew, 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 Sorry about that. I really didn't want to go after the congressman anyway. Um, I'm Megan Gaffney Buck. I'm the founder and CEO of Beta Data Solutions. We're an AI and machine learning company operating in the healthcare space. And I am the woman entrepreneur on the panel today. Hi, uh, I'm Julie Stutzel. I'm the managing director for the Chamber Technology Engagement Center, which is the tech policy hub for the US Chamber of Commerce. So. Um, we're going to have a, a lively discussion and hopefully you all will participate. I'm going to set the table a little bit. First, thank you, Dell, for having us. Dell is always pushing the envelope on both issues and policy and technology. Witness this cool, really cool space. We have a very experienced panel in these issues, so I'm going to be sort of the analyst just uh, setting the table. Um, people inside companies trying to make this happen, an elected official thinking about policies and, and incentives and ways to hold industry accountable and foster growth. Um, the first thing I'm going to say, I'll just put it out there, I think it's a myth that tech has, you know, should have a harder time getting women to participate than any other industry. Um, women do go into engineering and math these days at about 40% of schools, but they end up at about 10% of the jobs after the first year. There must be a reason for that. So a couple of facts. Overall, women are representing about 52% of college graduates. Women represent 50% of entry-level professionals across all industries, but 29% of vice presidents and 20% of C-suite executives. We all know that of Fortune 500 companies, 500, there are only six women CEOs. On the other hand, companies with 50% of women in senior operating positions show a 20% um, increased net revenue margin. The most gender diverse companies are much more likely to have financial returns above their industry averages. There are a lot of people doing work in this area. Um, the one I spend a lot of time paying attention to is a group called Paradigm for Parity, and they have a very simple uh, four-point action plan, which I will uh, tell you what it is. Five-point action plan, sorry, which I'll tell you what it is, and then um, we're going to have some more conversation. The first is you just have to minimize unconscious bias. 
That's a bit of a buzzword. We can talk a little more about what that means. People don't know. You have to focus on women in operating roles, not just in um, uh, PR. You have to measure targets and hold teams accountable. Sorry, dude. Unless you find me a woman or a person of color for this job, you do not get another person on your staff. That's called holding people accountable. Base promotions on results, not presence, meaning this industry and all industries have talked a lot about flex time, but we don't really do it. Um, and you need sponsors, not mentors. This is a big conversation that also deserves some more conversation, uh, that deserves more discussion. Um, sponsoring really means you are responsible for the people you are bringing up. Mentors mean occasionally you're going to have lunch with someone and give them some advice twice or three times a year. There's a difference. And I guess I would just add two more. Um, I do a lot of work on sexual harassment. These days, safety um, and a sense of gender inclusion in the workplace is very much top of mind. Um, don't minimize the importance of this for developing talent uh, in every workplace. Um, and finally, you know, look everywhere for signals. That's what, that's what people are doing. Um, and I don't want to get, you know, too political about this, but if you have this example of the um, Trump administration just gave companies permission to eliminate birth control as a benefit for women. Um, most companies like Dell um, said, no, we're going to give it to them anyway. But thinking about what benefits people are giving their companies, regardless of what policies are being talked about in Washington, has impact. So that's another thing that I think we should think about exploring. So with that, I will um, give it over to Angela yeah, for some thoughts. So let me say this first. So I've been doing diversity and inclusion for about the last 14 years. Um, I've done it in manufacturing, I've done it in finance, and now technology. So as I am building up my acumen about kind of what's going on in technology, and I'm the person, when I talk about entrepreneurial, I'm the per I, my job is to get people in the door to talk about tech. So a couple of things, that I have this thing called my new reality wall at Dropbox in terms of how I'm learning about the differences um, in tech. Um, so a couple of things, um, and so thank you for that, kind of uh, some of those, those stats. So when I look at some of the things that we're, we're trying to solve for, so I'd love to have dialogue around that, is um, my new reality at Dropbox is that I have an average age of 32, I have an average tenure of 3.5 years, and I have less than about 20% of women in that pipeline. So one of the reality is how do I, what is the new way we have to, th and, and I'm in an industry where we've talked about the war for talent for such a long time, it is real in tech, where people are getting calls. My job is to say, how do I stop you from taking that call, but how do I create a career in an organization that's about 2,000, right, and we're flat. So there's all these new nuances that I have to think through. Um, and I have um, a great group of young engineers who want to see change very quickly and not, and not willing to sit around. So I'm gonna set that stage in terms of my new reality. So although there are women that are going into engineering, coming out and graduating is 25%. So when we were doing our diversity report, I'm going, what number am I looking for? Am I looking for, if I get to 25%, are we there? And that just doesn't feel right. And for black and brown people, it's like 5% for Hispanic and 3% for African Americans, and that's going down. So what am I solving? Because 3% doesn't feel right for me. And so I go back to, and in terms of my job and, and STEM, and I'll talk a little about that, is that I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Any Chicago folks here? Woo woo! Okay, maybe that, I was waking you up. You guys need to wake me up, so. Um, and I grew up in inner city in Chicago. And college was not talked about in my household. It was, are you gonna get a job? Or my sister got pregnant at 16. My brother got incarcerated, started getting incarcerated when he was 12. So it was not something. My mother just wanted me not to get pregnant and not to go to jail. That was her dream for me, right? So I have a principal who was, and I, I really believe the power of education, who for the first time in my life told me I was smart and told me to take this thing called SA, a ACT. Anybody take the ACT test? So I go to take this test, and there's a passage, two passages. One is, there's Shakespeare passages, and I had to do analogies. Kid from the south side of Chicago, I have never, I've heard of Shakespeare, I probably saw it on PBS, 
but I have ne you should never read Shakespeare on a time test. And someone was going to, det and what I recognize even at that age is that someone was going to say to me, I was not smart enough or capable enough to go to their institution based on something I had never had access or opportunity or even exposure to. And that's the inequity of how I get people in. Um, and so we got to level the playing field around that. What I love about Dropbox and technology, because if you had told me when I was in high school STEM, that doesn't, it's not like sexy, I wouldn't want to do it, right? But, but with Dropbox, we talk about creative energy. We talk about how do we, how can you create and design? And I think we have to talk about this in a much more pragmatic way that not only get people to want to do this, but through college, because I was reading this interesting article about a woman who was an engineer, all her experiences were with other men. So the, the amount of isolation one might feel going through this is awful. It is awful. And so we got to get mass. We got to make sure that people know that this is an opportunity for us to build and create and not so much that it's kind of your engineer. Like when I grew up, it was mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. But it is about creation and it's about innovation and really repositioning that to get people interested. So that's why I love things like Black Girls Cold. But that's a long-term play, right? And I don't have people years to fix this. We got to resolve it now, and we have to think about it very differently than I'm used to thinking about it, and that is I can buy talent and I can build talent. And I got to do both, but I have to do both what I'm recognizing very differently. And I don't have the solve for it yet, because what I'm thinking takes a long time, um, or I'm going to poach. I, I, you know, <laughs> it's the only way I can do it, but I'm poaching from a little limited field. So we got to create more opportunity for people to get involved in this in very different ways, and then look at those transferable skills that allow them to get into the organ, get, get to tech, and then become an entrepreneur if they choose to do so. That's great. That's a very practical um, stating of the problem. Co Congressman, what, um, what uh, uh, do you think when you hear people in industry talk about, you know, this problem and how aware of the talent uh, problem is, you know, do you think your colleagues are? I think that you chair the technology task force in Congress, right? And um, are there things that public policy can do to help address some of this? There's absolutely things that public policy can be done to address this. And, and one, I want to thank Dell for getting us all together to, to talk about this issue. And, and I'm really here to listen. Um, I've benefited from being around sh strong, smart, talented women all my life. And I've learned something very simple from them. Shut up and listen and, and, <laughs> and do what they say. Um, and and so, so one of the things that by shutting up and listening to folks like y'all over – uh, the times I've been in Congress, I've learned access to capital for women entrepreneurs is nowhere near um, what it is for men. How do you do that? One way is making sure that we're funding the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and their women's centers, as well as their innovation funds, which is focused on getting women entrepreneurs the money they need in order to start their businesses. That's one thing we're working on. Number two, IT procurement. It's not a sexy topic. Um, when I decided I was going to run for Congress, IT procurement was not, you know, one of those things that crossed my mind. Um, but the way the federal government purchases IT goods and services is ridiculous. $90 billion is spent on this every year. 80% of that is on legacy systems. And the rules prevent the proverbial two gals in a garage from being able to sell their widget or service back into the federal government. So if you make that and if you, and if you break that system, then the talented folks are gonna be able to get that, that service in, into the government. And the third thing uh, I've learned, we have to make sure um, young women are exposed to technology at an earlier age. And one of the programs that, that I was thankful for Dell to help with is we introduced, we went to 42 teachers in South Texas and introduced coding into algebra class in seventh and eighth grade. So over three years, 5,000 you know, young men and women are gonna be exposed to coding at an early age because I've learned when you talk to, um, I, I've been, I have some of the poorest communities in my district throughout Texas. If you talk to young girls in seventh and eighth grade, you ask them what is their favorite topic, their favorite you know, class, 
90% of them will say math or science. And then what happens after that? I, I don't know the answer, but let's expose more, more people to that. So th those are, those are some, some very basic things um, that the federal government can be doing to get out of y'all's way to allow y'all to, to continue to innovate. And, and the last thing that I heard recently at the, um, at the Al Alice Summit or the Circular Summit, uh, again, Dell participates in that, is that um, when I was in school and I was studying computer science, there weren't a lot, of, we didn't have these robotics, comp like Robotics One, which is a great program. We didn't have the Cyber Patriot, which is another great program. But I've seen some really talented female engineers saying that we need to start having some of those kind of national programs that fit and resonate more with young women. Um, I don't know what that is. I hope somebody here has an idea um, and we can make sure we're connecting the right dots for things like that. Great, thanks. Let, let's just get um, what perfect entry point to the, our entrepreneur. So um, what do you think about that in terms of access to capital and other um, challenges that yeah. you and your colleagues have? Access to capital is the number one challenge for women who make the decision to start a company. Absolutely, hands down. Um, and, and for me, in my own experience, you know, I'm one of the ones who's broken the million dollar ceiling, which is the first hurdle for women entrepreneurs to get institutional funding of more than a million dollars. And so once you break through that threshold, you can be reflective a little bit about the process. And my experience is similar to those of other entrepreneurs that um, Harvard Business School did a large survey on the questions that female executives get asked when they're going to find capital. And they're defensive questions. It's questions about, are you mitigating risk? What happens if a competitor comes in? Have you protected your IP? And male counterparts, and I have a male co-founder, so I would watch him with the same people get a different set of questions. And those questions are, how big do you think you can exit? Could you be a unicorn? What kind of technology, you know, is this foundational to changing our economy? And you know, I can, my background was in politics, so I learned to answer the question you wanted them to ask you, not the one they actually asked you, so. Is that, is that what I'm doing wrong? Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on that later. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I talked about those aspirational things as a part of the process, but I think, you know, finding ways to not create a secondary capital system for women that's just focused on women, but opening up institutional capital and creating incentives for the institutional players that have more value than just money. Getting an investment from a Kleiner Perkins or an NEA isn't just about the check. It's about the network and the weight that that brings and the value of your company. Um, all the way down to sale that you benefit from. So we have to be conscious, and in my mind, of creating a system that includes women and doesn't create a secondary system that looks at women entrepreneurs as different entrepreneurs. We're actually the better bet financially. So part of that's about education, part of it is about putting women in the pipeline, and part of it is thinking about creative solutions. You know, I'm not a public policy expert, but I know the chamber is working to open those doors, and are there ways that we could incentivize traditional methods um, and, and capital avenues to really look at women in a different way. A perfect segue there. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Yeah, so just to um, include the audience here, how many people, when I say the word entrepreneur, immediately think of a woman? How about when I say CEO? So my entire life, I have always seen a woman. My mom was a, uh, she started a, a business and hired two women in the 80s and then grew that business to be um, close to 300 employees. And so this is a personal thing, but it's, but at the chamber, our jam is basically we believe in business and you better believe that includes uh, female founders and female entrepreneurs. So we are ecstatic when we can help support folks like, like Megan. And when you think about the chamber, I don't know, people might have a particular view of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but if you look at our number two, it's a female. If you look who's running our foundation, female. If you look at the people who are running our projects within the U.S. Chamber, female. And I have to give a shout out to my boss, Tim Day, who's here, because in our weekly meetings, he's 
vastly outnumbered by females in the room, and we're not taking notes. <laughs> so it's, it's a privilege to be able to work at the U.S. Chamber and to be able to uh, support female entrepreneurs and female CEOs um, as we continue to do our work. And one policy aspect that we might not have addressed here is a better understanding for the smaller companies, for the women who may want to make that leap from the traditional nine to five to more entrepreneur and um, I want to be my own boss, what are the things that are holding them back? And just last month we launched a, something we're calling the New Economy Working Group that addresses uh, particularly the safety net. You know, it's, you're already taking a big risk when you go out on your own to start, a, to, to start a business, but how can we mitigate that risk by creating a better safety net through portable benefits? So if you are a mom with kids, you don't have to gamble with, um, w w will I lose the, the traditional benefits that are afforded to me if I have a nine to five job? So that's a, just one example of the way that we're, um, uh, I guess, expanding the universe where we're taking a look at uh, barriers for females who are wanting to make that leap from nine to five to I want to be my own boss. Great. Um, thoughts from the audience or I'll just uh, kick a few things off. How, how many, um, I want to talk to the men too, I promise. But how many women in the audience are interested in shifting your work or looking for a new job um, and are not entirely sure how to go about it? Nobody's admitting this. <laughs> a couple. Um, because what I want to I wanna get to is somebody asking some questions about um, what, do, what does hold women back? Because, you know, statistically guys are not afraid to go on a new interview or apply for a job blind or call a friend and say, do you know somebody? And women traditionally don't do that. And we need more of that. So I'm wondering if there are any um, women in the audience who want to share. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ruth Chandler Cook and I'm the founder and CEO of Hire Her. So I'm glad to be here today. Yeah, and I'm representing um, DC Tech. And so we have a good understanding of politics. One of the things that we find in some of our research is that uh, the folks that are identifying high potential employees um, are sometimes uh, men or others that may um, also hold those applicants back. So one of the things that we're encouraging is for people to be able to self-select, yes, I'm a high potential employee, I need to be in your um, executive or leadership pipeline. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing uh, maybe from uh, Dropbox or Dell how you guys are um, creating opportunities for women and minorities in your pipelines. I, I'm happy to take that first. Uh, and I think our general counsel, Rich Rothward, might be here. He is the biggest champion of diversity, inclusion, and identifying high-performing folks and moving them up the pipeline. I'm, I'm in this seat because Rich identified me early when I was, you know, entry-level guy and said, I think you're going to, I think you've got talent will help you move up, but it, it requires investment from the higher levels and a commitment not just to running an excellent legal department in Rich's case, but a, a, a commitment to also being an excellent manager in developing talent, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's on the individual senior leader of the stack. And the way Rich does it is starting early, identifying folks, partnering you off, get, get, taking you into a diversity, a, a, a a round table of senior leaders and having those senior leaders sort of interact with you and those senior leaders identifying, all right, here's how Chris was awesome. Mm -hmm. Here are the gaps Chris has and Chris's manager, here are the things you need to do for Chris to be able to move up. So Rich does that fantastically and I think it's represented in the gender mix that he has reporting to him on his team. Uh, the question is, how do you take that? Part of it is innate, innately rich, but part of it is, you know, take the formula, package it, and pass it around, right, and make it scale. I would add to that. I, I echo all those, those comments. I think you have to also have a sense of deliberate. You have to be very deliberate, and what gets measured gets done. Yeah. So I think it is, we, sometimes we think it's going to happen organically because we have people in the mix. But it was interesting when you asked about how many people wanted to be CEOs because I think we're probably preaching, I saw a lot of people say, yeah, but that's not typical. I think, and for a woman trying to move, you're out of context. So if I'm always seeing people who look like me as CEOs and then I say I want to be a CEO, 
I'm not in that spectrum. So we have to be deliberate about how we move talent and we have to be unapologetic in that. Um, and we have to also build awareness because the other side that you get to is you don't want anyone to feel that they got a position because. Right, so there's a balance that you really have to have. So we're also asking our leads, and we're a young company, um, and asking each staff member to have we, what we call powwows with small groups of people so they can see the talent, they can see how the talent is interacting, and then to your point say, okay, I got my eye on you. And then we can have that conversation during talent because what I find over time is that it's about relationships and it's about I have to see you. So we have to create, my job is to create the platform where they can see and then say, hey, did you see how, she, how they interact in that meeting? But it has to be deliberate and, it, and people have to be accountable and we can't apologize for it. Hi, my name is Libby Wooler. I'm with a DC-based tech startup called Quorum. Um, and our challenge is that we're bootstrapped. Um, so when we think about diversity or we think about recruiting women, uh, I was employee six and I was the only female on the team for the first year. Um, how do we think about diversity and deliberately grow a diverse team where we're approaching number 50 now um, without a VC-backed kind of support system and without the ability to scale very quickly and hire the type of talent and poach uh, in a way that a, a, a bootstrap company just can't do. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that because we, we bootstrapped early on as well um, and we were able to maintain gender parity through that process, both as an unfunded and a funded company. And I think one of the things is to talk about it and have the senior leaders of your company every day and in their public forums talking about wanting to find the best women and wanting them to come and work at your company, whether it's male leadership or female leadership. And we've actually had women seek us out. We had a data scientist who um, was top of her field, PhD level um, physicist who was working in a lab doing AI at Microsoft, who sought us out on LinkedIn and said, I wanna come and work for you because you're talking about the things that matter to me and this is a place where I wanna be. So I think, it, you know, being really deliberate and outspoken within the leadership of your company and having women within your company have a voice publicly about this being a place where women can come and work and exceed to the to the highest levels of the decision making of the company will, will go a long way. I think you to know, that. Uh, I'll just, <laughs> you know, uh, South by is always one of those things where, where we try and take action, deliverable action items, right? So the action item from last year that we brought back that I announced at the earlier panel was the creation of a 501c3 called Congress Fund. And a part of the idea behind Congress Fund is to develop diversity and inclusion blueprints for companies that are 15, 16, 50 people. So you can start thinking about those things in a smart way before you get to 5,000, 50,000. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, one of the people that was a part of that conversation and that's a part of the C3 is a guy named Alex Worth who is the founder of Quorum. Thank you very much. And I was, was going to add to that as well to say that the beauty of that is that you can, it's hard to turn a ship when it, it, you're in midstream. So having it in the beginning stages of a build of a company, um, my goal has never been to be the chief diversity officer more than five. I thought this job would go away. So as you are building your company, you have an opportunity so it does, it, it, be, it can become part of your DNA and it's not a separate conversation that you now have to have. I also want to talk about visible representation matters, Wakanda, because people want to see themselves, they want to see people like them. I will base myself, if I'm going to go to a company, seeing someone that looks like me says, okay, I can do it. So I would also encourage you as you're hiring leaders, it is visible representation matters. I just wanna, I wanna add on, on to that. I'm, I'm on the board of an organization called Running Start, and its, its goal is to get more women running for political office, and they have this great initiative that says, I look like a politician, right? And it's all these awesome young girls from, from, from around the country, and they do this training program up in Washington, D.C., and, and, and learning about the skills and, and, and talents that you need in order in order to run, and I think there's a need for something like that with, with younger folks, because mm -hmm. you're not learning how to be an entrepreneur in school, yep. right? You don't learn, there's not, I don't, I don't remember a you know, class in high school being like entrepreneurship 101. Um, so can we start at a younger age in with, with, with young girls in high school about 
I look like a, I look like an entrepreneur. And I think that is going to help us make sure we increase that pipeline uh, of talented folks. Um, yeah, I was just going to say w one stat, and then I'll, um, I want to hear what you have to say, which is that there was recently a survey of um, large and small CEOs, and the majority of the male CEOs thought that diversity and inclusion was important, but not connected to the um, business at hand. And the percentage of women CEOs felt the opposite. And so it's so important, this issue of DNA, and that you believe that it actually is relevant to the success of your business. And as that, it, nothing will change until that changes in some respects. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ken, and um, I've been self-employed most of my life. And my stake here is I've raised four daughters, um, and they're all gifted and intelligent and uh, I'd say fiercely independent. Um, and I talk with them about doing their own thing a lot. Um, but the thing I run into is the story. And, and so to follow up on your, your comments, how do you get mainstream media to tell the story more of women who have succeeded so that the younger women have those role models? Since I work at CNN, if I had a dollar for every, for every time someone said, why won't the media just focus on X? Um, so the short answer is I haven't a clue. Um, other than, uh, you know, I think that the thing that the media does do is sort of pick and choose, you know, elements of, of you know, buzz, wherever that is. Um, and, you know, whether it's in politics or entertainment or in business or, you know, something that generates uh, attention. And so in some respects, it's, it's, it's almost backwards. The, the attention has to be given from a community, from an, you know, a story, from a success, and then media will, you know, you know, fly to it like, what is it, flies on honey or something, I flies on shit. I forget what the term is, <laughs> um, which is maybe more what the media does. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and so I, I, I do think that, that media attention matters, but I, but I think we can't underestimate sort of how community leadership and peer-to-peer and -peer really matters more. I, I agree with that. I have two daughters. And before I came here, I was telling them what I was going to do and who I was talking with. And, and like I said, I grew up with my mom as a CEO, and it matters. It, and it might not be in, sensationalized in the headlines, but showing those everyday examples so you see yourself in that role. It's not maybe I could be this. It's I think I want to do that because they know it's an option. And I find every opportunity available to steer that into their minds. I, I would say one other thing that's important too in the conversation is not just interviewing or talking to women about women's issues mm -hmm. in technology. Um, I, it's one of the reasons why I'm endeared to the folks at CTEC at the chamber because I'm an AI CEO and I'm a woman and there aren't a lot of times when people are talking about AI policy and machine learning and I'm included in that conversation as a CEO of a tech company and I'm not asked to speak about work-life balance or about um, STEM education for girls. Those are things that I care about, but women need to see female leaders talking about economic policy and talking about the nuts and bolts technology of their companies and included in those conversations if we're gonna be seen as you know, equal partners at the table. Really important point. Other thoughts from... Um Hi, I'm Christina Wilcox. I'm the director of the Women's High Tech Coalition in Washington, D.C. Um, and after an event here at South by two years ago, um, Chris will like this, we convened an event um, on women entrepreneurship in D.C. where we heard from entrepreneurs. Dell helped us out, C-Tech helped us out. Um, and we just listened to um, what you know women entrepreneurs on the ground were saying and, and how Congress could help. But um, based on something Hillary was talking about, the number one thing that they were looking for was not a mentor, but a sponsor, someone to get them in the room they wanted to be in that they would never otherwise be um, you know, in. So I don't know if our entrepreneur has any ideas. Are there, are there platforms or places women who are just starting can go to get connected to, to folks like you, um, someone that they look up to and, and wanna know, how did you get where you got? Yeah, sure, there are a couple organizations, and then I saw the congresswoman came in, so we'll give her. 
a second. I didn't want to take your take your time, but um, yeah, the Veneta Project is one. It's um, a really great organization. It's in most major cities across the country. It's focused entirely on female founders and people who want to support them. Um, I gained a mentor who's actually at a senior level at Deloitte who has held my hand and pulled me up the ladder in every way possible. So um, that's really important organization. Uh, Women's High Tech Coalition has been great as well. And then there was an organization that isn't entirely focused on women, but is made up of a lot of women um, leaders that I really like. It's called The Bridge. Um, and Ali is here, the founder of that organization. It's about connecting women in, in D.C., or people in D.C. to people in the Bay Area and the tech community. But it's made up of a lot of senior leaders that are working in tech that are female, that have been willing to reach out and, and mentor and, and really actively pull up the next generation of entrepreneurs. So check out any of those, I think, are, are all great places to start. And creating those resources is really important because people do need to know where to go. I want to introduce Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who just joined us, um, and we're grateful she did. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to be too girly about this, but she's rocking some amazing shoes here. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you see, that's what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, uh, we were just talking about um, barriers for women and uh, the, the need for um, it to be taken seriously at the highest level. Uh, Congressman Hurd raised a few points about what he thinks um, the public policy issues are, and so uh, uh, the floor is yours. I don't know if you have thoughts on either of those two things. Sure, first of all, let me thank Dell and acknowledge all of our panelists, uh, in particular my colleague uh, from the other side of the aisle, the Texan, uh, Mr. Will Hurd. It's great to be in your part of the country for such a wonderful occasion. There are uh, challenges, and we know that, whether it's access to capital, uh, whether it's investment from venture and equity firms. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the government has a significant role to play in, in bringing down those barriers. Uh, I serve on the Small Business Committee in the House of Representatives, as well as the Energy and Commerce Committee. And one of the challenges is to uh, make the Small Business Administration more relevant in terms of how they interface with the private sector and incentivizing uh, their participation in terms of lending. Uh, you know, we have great programs but when people are hardwired on uh, male-dominated uh, lending, it's very challenging to get them to change their lens. And so I think the Small Business Administration has uh, a lot more work to do, particularly in the space where we know that women's businesses uh, are the fastest growing in the nation. And the historic uh, sort of... Um, uh, indicators of success uh, are not necessarily applicable to women's businesses. So we need to look at what makes women's business so successful, how they start, what are their origins, where do they typically get their startup funds from, and find a way to undergird that, bolster it, uh, promote, uh, and, and really create uh, mentoring opportunities for small businesses owned by women uh, to flourish. I, I have found that there are a number of actually corporate entities that have realized that uh, this is the route to go. In particular, uh, Goldman Sachs that has its, I think it's 1,000 small, 10,000, 10, that's right, 10,000 small businesses. And they've done a great job uh, really in undergirding women, uh, strengthening them, providing sort of the wraparound services for success in business. And so uh, my uh, focus is to make sure that uh, where the opportunities present themselves, we disrupt uh, this sort of uh, mainstay of uh, men can do this. Uh, we, they're far more trustworthy. They're better bang for the buck when we know that women will put paper clips and staples together and come out with like this fantastic company uh, and know that in the long run, 
you are the employers, uh, not only sole proprietors, but as business grows, the need to include others, and you oftentimes have a far more diverse uh, workforce. And so, uh, to be uh, fully transparent, I want to see women's business grow because I know what it means for opportunities for people who typically uh, don't have access to opportunity. So uh, that, that's a long answer to a short question. That's right. um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and so um, I and we don't often get uh, this um, kind of intimate attention with um, esteemed members of Congress. So I do want, if people in the audience have things you would like to see Congress do, um, now's your chance. Um, to, uh, and, and share, Hillary, to share your I, ideas with them. And, and can, um, I, can, I add, can I add to that? Um, your, your individual member of Congress can be very helpful in helping you grow your business. Not only can they help you connect you with um, organizations in your field, and that helps you possibly get more access to business, but if there is, a, if there is some things getting in your way, that member can help figure out how to fix that. And so, so engage with your member locally. Um, also, you should understand which members are involved in the issue that your business is in and know those people when you go through Washington, D.C. Um, you know, Congress, look, I, I ran for Congress because um, I was shocked by the caliber of our elected leaders. You know, if I had met someone like Yvette Clark, I probably would have stayed in the CIA because I would have been happy that our, our, our government was in good hands. Um, but, but, but engaging and helping them understand what you're doing, that's an opportunity that every elected official will want to highlight and, and help promote. So know the district director of your member of Congress, know their chief of staff, know that actual member, and know which relevant committees in Congress have a regulatory connection to your to your individual business. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, thanks, Paige. Thanks, Dell, for inviting us. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm the president of uh, the Mexico's SBA. It's called INADEM, and uh, and uh, I just want to share our experience uh, in Mexico. Uh, this is uh, this is something that we've tried to go across the board. President Peña got it from day one. He said, he, I was elected by women, and I believe women can change Mexico. So he went across the board. Everybody has to have in his cabinet a policy for women inclusion, policy so that women get a level playing field. So two things. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, well, I think that's, uh, it's got to be an affirmative action from, number, from the highest ranking officer in the country. And he oversees that personally. Now, uh, so it happens everywhere. Uh, as, as far as the Mexican SBA, INADEM, uh, the, we call it the, uh, the National Institute for Entrepreneurs, uh, we've created, uh, recognizing that access to finance for entrepreneurs is really difficult for women, especially they get lower valuations and they get all sorts of things when they ask for credit. We created uh, a special guarantee for uh, women for financing. Uh, and it's a guarantee that we give banks, and this is only for women. Women entrepreneurs and, and, and SMEs run are led by women. So we take affirmative actions. We give special points for the grants. If you're, a, if, if you're a woman, you get special points. I know sometimes women criticize, well, I don't want a special policy for this. But we need to do that. We need to take a stand. And sometimes I even say we need to discriminate against men. And I'm sorry for this. And I, I, I tell my people, well, sue me. <laughs> no, really, you as a public officer, you need to take these type of commitments and these type of risks. So that has to go across the board. I mean, I can give you many examples. We created a whole network that we call Women Moving Mexico. It's a special uh, program where we invest a lot of money to create capabilities and capacities for women. And it's all over. It's in nine states today. It's especially united with the, with, the, with the private sector to have this as a knowledge board. And they, they give women 10 weeks of very uh, sophisticated training so that they can become uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Now, on the policy side, we were so blunt to, so as to go and change the law. And we now have a law where parties 
are forced to have half of their candidates as women that run for Congress, wow. be it Senate or be it uh, uh, the House. So that's, that's a really aggressive law, but we believe that if you don't give power to the women that are being in the pipeline, as you have said, they need to get leadership. So half of the women, now we have 47% of Congress are women. Wow. That's moving along. It's the, it's the largest, I think, worldwide today. And we hope that women get more positions. Now, on the other side, and this will, with this I finish, I honestly, I have a round table for discussion on entrepreneurship for women and women inclusion where Paige is, and, and Dell is, is, is our member of this round table that we have, I have at the uh, Mexican SBA. Uh, and uh, we found, and this is critical, that women sometimes do not help women. And it happens when they're children, when they're, when they're, when they're young, Sometimes the moms don't help. Sometimes the moms say, well, you have to do other things, not, not STEM stuff, and so forth. But in the national organizations, in the, in the coalitions for women, sometimes they fight against each other. And I say, well, if we want to create critical mass for women, we need you to unite and not own the agenda, because it's become a political agenda. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll just say, I kind of hate when men say that. But. Thank you for that. And as, as my grandmother, my Yiddish grandmother would say, maybe we can make a shit here with um, uh, the congressman and uh, congresswoman and, and getting some tips on what they could do with the SBA uh, in the U.S. to further those goals. Um, let's take one final question, and then I think Chris is going to have some um, uh, wrap up. So when we talk about um, kind of the capital for these endeavors, um, how do you bring the people who are actually making those decisions? And, and, and I say that to say I, I, I didn't hear anyone mention that they were a venture capitalist or were able to lend the money. How do you get those people to have the buy-in, right? So I've been in conversations in rooms where people have grassroots efforts, have started up to, to fund initiatives and, and opportunities and um, businesses, but how do we get those bigger people with bigger money to buy in to this idea that it's needed and necessary in this kind of state of emergency around pushing this agenda? So I, the chamber's obviously not a VC, but one of the things I think we do well is convene. And so we're, we are made up of three million businesses some very big, some very small. And so we're able to pull those people together in the same room and, and open up a, an opportunity or at a minimum have that exposure that you might not other, otherwise have. Let me, let me say this. You know, the, the, we, we should not be fooling ourselves. Um, I found the VC community to be extremely closed. They circulate amongst each other. They all went to undergrad together. They all went to grad school together. So they trust each other and they just keep circulating amongst each other. We gotta, we gotta expand, quite frankly, um, and, and, and get more women in, into the VC space. Um, you know, we can try to do as much as we can uh, to uh, give exposure and provide opportunities for the VC community to meet small business. But if they're hardwired on what they believe is the safe bet, which is betting amongst their friends, it's very challenging, quite frankly, to crack the code with them. But I think if we begin a farm team of, of, of folks who come in with the understanding that it's a great investment to help the women businesses to grow, um, then we're doing a good thing. Um, so I think that it's not an either or situation, but I don't want us uh, to fantasize about that community because I found them to be extremely insular. Um, and uh, generally speaking, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to throw everybody in, in the same pot, but I found uh, amongst uh, some of those companies, they're very insular. And so we now have to look at, you know, angel communities, things of that nature, people who are far more um, open to the idea that women-owned businesses are a good bet. 
and, and so with that, I think we are at time. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out. I wanna encourage everyone to continue the conversation and to work on action items that came out of this conversation. To do that, the easiest way is to connect with me on LinkedIn and tell me that you were a part of this conversation and we will stand up a group where we will over the year talk about the issues that were here and develop action items. As I said in our earlier event, please don't sign up if you're not willing to take an action item, right? Because I'm not interested in continuing talking, that's great, but I'm handing out, we are handing out action items and holding each other accountable to executing them this time next year. And we really do mean that, we wanna drive action. Uh, also another, uh, another little thing that we've been working on that Hillary Maxwell from Dell has been leading, but that uh, Congressman Heard and Congresswoman Clark have been working on is a tweak to the uh, 8A classification and legislation. That was an idea that came out of South by a couple of years ago in part, uh, and, and I think Congressman Heard was a part of that conversation two years ago, where there's a challenge for women looking to sell to the government, where if they're looking to scale and they take VC money, which usually means VC equity, VC ownership, right? Then you don't qualify as a woman-owned small business, even though you're still the boss and you're running the show. The language was written sort of before VCs became VCs, right? So that business model wasn't what it is now. So I encourage you after this to talk to the Congresswoman and the Congressmen, give them more ammo as they continue to try and tweak this legislation so you don't have to choose between selling to the government, which is big bucks, and taking VC money to scale, which you can't actually deliver to the government if you can't scale. It's a nasty catch-22. Please. Just, just quickly want to add that the administrator for the SBA is a woman, Linda McMahon. Shame her. Hello, tweet her, you know, <laughs> send some information to her about this issue because the more pressure that we build, uh, oftentimes it, it yields the diamond. So let's, let's, you know, engage as well. You can talk to both of us, but there's a woman already there. All right, and with that, thank you everyone for coming out. This is a great conversation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>